for the invitation. Uh, we are starting at half past four and uh, yes, we're aiming to start on the dot because we have got quite a lot of things to, uh, exciting things I should say, to get through uh, this evening. So um, hello to all of you and uh, once again it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to our second um, Early Years Leadership Online Symposium. Quickly before we start, um, if I have to run off or you hear the strains of Peppa Pig or screaming, I do apologise. I have a toddler just over there. She's been very good at the moment. Um, so uh, the, contribu the contributions and um, the buzz around our last symposium really got us thinking about um, how we can make the changes that we are so desperate to see for the sector. And so the theme of this symposium is early years finding our voice. Um, for those of you who are new to the Leadership in Early Years Education group, uh, we were founded about five years ago as one of the research interest groups under the British Educational Leadership and Educational Research Society, aka BELMAS. It was a response to the comparative lack of up-to-date research in this area and sought to bring together practitioners and academics to better understand what early years leadership looks like. Um, I can highly recommend uh, membership of Belmas for those of you who may be interested. It provides you with access to uh, high quality research, networking opportunities. There's an excellent annual conference uh, that has usually has com um, contributions from all around the world. And so I'll put the web address in the chat for you to have a look at later on if you are interested. So Fortune uh, has smiled on us once again in terms of our speakers, and we have got uh, three fabulous individuals coming to speak to you tonight. Um, so firstly, um, we will be addressed by Aaron Bradbury Coffey, who many of you already know, I believe. And um, he's a principal lecturer at Nottingham Trent University, and he has extensive experience across the sector. Uh, secondly, we have um, Tanisha Thompson from the London Early Years Foundation, and she's the manager of their Brixton nursery. And finally, we have Ellen Dektar, who joins us all the way from California, where I'm led to believe it is the morning. And um, she is a policymaker for community and children's development. Uh, so each of these wonderful speakers will be giving us a 10 minute talk on how we as a sector can make our voices heard. And after that, we will be moving into small breakout rooms to have um, finer grain discussions. And then we'll come back together for a chance to put some questions to our speakers. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, Mona will be uh, launching a little poll. Um, this is because we have to collect information about who is a Belmas member and who is not to send back to head office. And um, we love to see your faces. It's fantastic, um, particularly for any of you who, who have been working in academia and are used to the little black boxes to see faces is delightful. Um, however, could I ask you to ensure that your mics are off unless you are speaking, um, just so we don't get any feedback or interruptions. And if you have got any questions, please pop them in the chat all the way through. Um, Mona and myself will be monitoring them and um, try to get back to you as soon as we can. And post breakout groups as well. If you have questions you'd like to put to the speakers, pop them all in the chat and um, the speakers will address those questions uh, that they feel most able to answer. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to our first speaker, Aaron. Lovely to have you this evening. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's really, really exciting to be here. And um, I don't know about you, but uh, we definitely, at this moment in time, really need to refocus and look at our early years voices. So it couldn't be so pertinent than now. Um, I'm actually going to be looking at where we are now and where do we want to be um, I'm an advocate for raising our voices within early years and I've been talking about this and so many other people have been talking about this for a lot longer than I have. So um, I am Aaron Bradbury Coffey and Principal Lecturer at Nottingham Trent University um, for childhood and early years. So I'm just going to give you an overview really on who we are, where we're at and what our current early years sector kind of looks like with some of the uh, key issues 
that we've got facing us. So who are we? So um, we are, um, you know, 87% female, 3% male. I know that there are many people in here uh, joining us this evening that are advocates for bringing more males into the sector. Um, we still have an over-reliance on our 16 to 19 education level three professionals. Um, we do have a wide ranging graduate workforce um, and non-graduates um, and our government sees them very much, not the sector, but the government sees them very much on a level playing field. Um, and we also have another level playing field, which is the perception that maintain nurseries um, and PVIs. Again, we see ourselves on a level playing field, but the reality is that the government and the reality is that we're not. So um, what motivates us as practitioners, as professionals to go into the earlier sector? Um, and what is the real picture around this? And the joint research for the National Centre for Social Research did um, some research on this. Um, and these are things that we can all, we all know for a fact that this is kind of a true picture of our earlier sector. Um, we've got poor pay progression, very low salaries. Um, we've got an increase in workload and responsibility. Um, there are very much physical and emotional demands of the job. I'm 36, you wouldn't think I am, I probably look more like 56. Um, it's exacerbated by increasing paperwork and demands from employers and parents. Um, there's an inability to support a family on current salaries. The amount of professionals that I talk to on a daily basis who work in early years are constantly telling me that actually they don't earn enough to be able to um, go and buy their own home or even just feed themselves and their family. Um, and this lack of social recognition for the early years education. Um, there's still that perception that it's an easy option that everybody can do. And it's that kind of rhetoric that I'm going to focus on. So if we, cur if we currently look at early years today, um, I'm sure that we would all want to be on the uh, right hand side, which is those lovely colorful, um, everything's in its place. Um, but in reality, um, we're now facing a real element of chaos within our sector. And um, our earlier voices could not be needed more than any, any time since um, I've even started the career. I think they're needed more now than ever. But the realisation, there's a piece of research that was done by Helen Perkins, is um, the, the bottom one really that I want to focus on, which is what is the value of actually being qualified in early years? Because being qualified in the early years is actually um, something that we should be proud of, something that we should be really kind of shouting about. Um, and, you know, we still have this kind of graduate level three. You know, we all know that graduates can really, really change the um, practice within our settings. But actually, it's really, really important that we also recognise the practice that our level three practitioners offer too. Um, I am talking really, really fast, guys, because I know I've only got 10 minutes and you, everybody who knows me knows I can talk forever. So um, I, I made this because I, I felt that this is currently where we're at today within our early years picture. Um, when we're talking about early years voices, are early years voices actually being heard of? No. Um, last Monday, I sent an email to my MP. I'm still waiting on a reply now. If I was probably a big business boss, talking very much about, you know, the money that my factory is going to bring in or something. I can tell you now that my MP probably more than likely would have got back to me quite quickly. But because it's early years, I'm still waiting for that reply now. So maintaining PVI sectors, we're constantly playing a tug of war. Um, the current rhetoric is, you know, everyone says we're all one sector. And I do fundamentally believe we are. And I know many people do believe we are. But the realisation is, is that actually the government, the policy holders um, have this idea and then our earlier sector, our maintained nursery sector, our PVIs are constantly playing that tug of war where we're, where we're continually fighting, we're continually battling for our voices to be heard. So these are just some of the ways that I feel that we can change this really. Um, 
obviously we do need to bring more investment in um, and one way to do that is to look at where that investment really can matter um, and, and obviously graduates is, is one of those but we do need to hear more informed research from the ground you know we need to be hearing those practitioner researchers we need to be changing policy um, this for me is a really important one I'm going to talk about the early years academy in a moment but we've got to get to a collective voice and unfortunately we still have a long way to go um, I'm quite lucky that I talk to many professionals managers practitioners across the sector and many people still don't even know their rights um, how they can actually um, become research informed so actually we need that collective responsibility we need to be getting that information out there which also informs our collective voice for change there's been some fantastic research highlighting what we're currently going through and actually what we're currently going through is nothing new um, we're just we're just seeing it through a different lens earlier has always been treated this way you know it's just that coronavirus has exacerbated it um, so dr valerie daniels has really kind of supported that and she talks about the conflict that we're constantly dealing with um, a fantastic piece of research really suggest you go and read it but how do we start it and where do we want to go? For me, we've got to start within. We've got to start with our own practitioners, our own professionals. We've got to change. We've got to have that collective voice before we can move on and actually say to people, this is what we want. OK, so we really, really need to know what we want. Um, what that will do is it will strengthen the value of our voices as the collective there are, there are thousands of early years practitioners out there and imagine that the impact that they can have if they um, had that collective voice. Um, for me, it's, I, I feel that actually these are some ways that we can really start to get our voices heard by being seen as um, equal ECEC um, practitioners. Um, so there is knowledge beyond level three, we all know that, but in reality, lots of nurseries can't pay those graduate prices, uh, those wages. Um, we, we all know that more value needs to be given to early years practice. For me, one way to kind of enhance that is um, as part of my research and one of my outcomes that I'm looking at is very much a post-qualifying year, which would have a regulatory body as part of that, a little bit like the teaching, social work, nursing. Um, I want to move away from level three and actually enhance that to a level four. We've got to be realistic, guys. We, you know, yes, degrees are important, but you know, we're working with governments that don't ultimately understand children. They don't ultimately understand that actually we start at zero, um, not at five. Um, so in that rhetoric, I'm kind of thinking maybe we need to start slowly and look at a level four. Um, but we do need to look at government backing of a more governed approach to the role. Um, and obviously employers need to become united as part of that too. Um, one way that I really, really do fundamentally believe, because um, I've done a little bit of research on this, is through the new um, Early Years Academy that myself and Jules, Juliet Davis of EY Matters has kind of set up. And we've got a fantastic um, group of people who are supporting us with this. And one way that I fundamentally believe we can really gain the traction of hearing our early years voices is very much about giving them a new recognition new level of recognition um, which would actually really kind of instill that confidence that ability to be able to say actually you know i've been recognized by the early years academy as um you know a fellow of the early years academy and i know that you know what my practice my thinking my my knowledge can really, really be supported here. And it just gives you that confidence to be able to actually speak up and say, you know, actually, I know what I'm talking about. Not only am I qualified, but I've also had recognition by these guys as well. Um, so that is basically how I feel that early as practitioners can really, really raise their voices. Um, and I feel that our voices are needed more than ever. And if we come as a collective, 
our voices will be heard. Thank you. Aaron, thank you so much. Thank and you. Exactly on time as well. Oh, Couldn't have asked for better. <laughs> Um, yes, the, 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 the points that you're raising there are just so resonant for so many of us. I, I, I remember sort of the disappointment I felt after um, I completed my degree and my early years professional status and just thought, actually, this has, has made no difference to my professional life whatsoever. And um, yeah, it, that was just incredibly disappointing. So, so, so thank you so much for, for, for all of that. Well, um, we, we must move on now, and um, it's time for us to hear from our second speaker, uh, Tanisha. Welcome. Hello, thank you. Hello, everyone. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about how, how do we communicate the importance of uh, early years to others, and I'm just going to speak from experience and what I do as a nursery manager and so on. Um, sorry, I won't be able to give you eye contact because I'm reading from my slides on the computer. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so how 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 I and my team and people who I work with communicate the importance of early years to others is true is through our pedagogy um, and through our values. Um, events that we do with the parents, workshops, outings, home learning, action research and project plans. So those are some of the things that we do to communicate the importance of early years um, to, to everybody. And I guess that the main people are the parents, the teachers and the community. And from doing that, we, you know, we hope that what our aim is, is to bring a better understanding of the importance of early years and to hopefully um, make a difference. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our pedagogy. So our pedagogy is built specifically for our early years, um, taking into consideration their, their age and their stage of development. It's For us, it's important because it supports and builds and strengthens the staff's um, ability to understand their role and their purpose, um, to value parent partnership and pedagogical conversations that we have with the parents, which what we want is to is to enable the parents to have a better understanding of the importance of early years and to and to you know raise the bar so that they can see how important it is um through parents events um we've been able to reach so much families so um for example we've had families who when they've started the nursery um, the parents were really shy they didn't want to um, speak to anybody they would just push the children inside or just being on the phone um, and through parents events um, they've been able to really build um, a social community a community outside of the nursery by making friends with the other parents and so on we've had parents who um, do not speak english and were able to form relationships um, with other parents and find out services in the community and so on. Um, so those are all the things um, that I think supports um, starting to, to, to show everybody how important early years is. And then I guess, yeah, and so on. Um, the second thing is how do we overcome the division in the sector so that we can stand stronger together. I feel the, the reason why there is a division is because there is a lack of understanding of the importance of services in the early years and child development um, and, and how and awareness of how the children's outcome will affect them in their later lives. Um, so yeah, I think that's one of the, the reasons why there is a division in the sector um so yeah so um how it shapes the, uh, the 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 children's character and empower them to improve their capabilities and their life chances um i don't think it's understood by by many people and i think that's why i don't feel we're respected or valued as much as other sectors um and i think that's one thing i'd like to see um change is for everyone to have a better understanding how important it is for children to meet their early their early goals their prime areas um, i've worked with um 
a group of teenagers who have left care, um, care and they're learning to live on their own and so on. And I could really see the link with them and the two and three year olds that, I've, that I work with and how they really struggle in their prime areas, um, not being able to communicate their feelings, express themselves. And you can just see the impact of if um, of how it then affects them later on in their lives if it's not achieved early on. So I really think that, you know, a lot of more work needs to go into um, the sector really raising the bar and, and having a voice so that everyone could see how important it is for society for us to really invest in this age group. Um, also engagement with the community, working, I've, um, I've worked with quite a few nurseries um, within LEAF. Um, one of them was a social impact nursery. Um, I worked in, in um, South London, in Peckham. 90% of the children had additional needs. Um, they would come in, no language, no social interaction at the age of three and so on um, and two. And then still the schools were taking them younger and younger at the age of two. So I had to do a lot of work in the community just to, um, to express to them the importance of them staying in the nursery for longer so that they can be nurtured and we can really look after them um, before they go to school because they were going to school before they're school ready. And so just working in, in partnership with the children's centres and so on, um, that's another thing. There's not many children's centres around anymore. So um, I think uh, I, I would love to see some change in in the government and in the policies to bring back lots of early year services like there was before because I think that it's really impacting on um, how um, children are developing and it's just making the gap wider and so on. Um, in terms of how to inf influence policy to in enable a stronger early years um, policy, um, I think that policies are better influenced um, when parents are more informed about what good quality childcare looks like. Um, I do that through um, parent engagement, working with the teachers to make sure that they um, have as much CPD training as possible. Um, and just, just having lots of day-to-day -day conversation with the parents, projects that we do at the moment, we're doing a literacy project and it's all about empowering the parents to understand that small things that they do at home could have a really big impact on the children and so on. So I think it's all about um, strengthening um, the parents' knowledge as well, the teachers, the, 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 the staff that you work with and so on. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you ever so much, uh, Tanisha. Thank you. Um, yes, really, really important point that you raised there about mm -hmm. the fact that um, so many of our, our own parents mm -hmm. don't really appreciate uh, the value yeah. of the work that we're doing with their children. Exactly. And, but this is, this is a really interesting issue to tackle. I'm not sure how mm -hmm. we do it. Mm -hmm. I am very aware that now I just had to Google her because I'm no good at the mm -hmm. royal stuff. Mm -hmm. Duchess of Cambridge um, mm -hmm. was recently in the media um, doing this five questions thing and talking mm -hmm. about how important um, early years are. Mm -hmm. Has this made a difference? I, I, I'll, I'll leave the question hanging there and perhaps mm. people can put something in the chat later. I don't know if any parents have come in going, oh, I saw the Duchess of Cambridge saying this is all wonderful stuff you're doing. Yeah. I suspect not, but yeah. Mm. Thank you ever so much, Tanisha. Thank you. Um, and finally, um, Ellen Dektar. Um, can't wait to, to, to hear uh, what you're bringing us from across the Atlantic. Yes. Well, um, I was going to say good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, good evening to you. Uh, it's morning in California, and I am lucky enough to live very close to the Golden Gate Bridge and, and my background there. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. And I think we share so many common challenges that transcend states, countries. And I really appreciate uh, getting to hear what you're thinking about and share a little bit of what we've been working on um, at various levels of government in the United States. Uh, I'm 
been with the Alameda County, California Early Care and Education Program for 20 years, to my surprise, because I love connecting um, child care programs with policymakers. And that's what we do at uh, the agency I work with. Uh, we're part of Alameda County, which is one of the larger counties in California. Uh, I've been working on child care program advocacy for about 30 years from both within and without the government. Um, started with a national children's advocacy group called the Children's Defense Fund, and then uh, went to work in the state government in California in the Capitol, working on legislation related to child care during welfare reform. Uh, then moved to the San Francisco mayor's office and then I've been with Alameda County for 20 years. So I'm bringing a little bit of insight. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I'll just give you a little overview of what I'm gonna talk about. First of all, I just wanted to take a peek at uh, the numbers of our children and how um, different levels of government or organization compare uh, the Uni United Kingdom and California and the United States. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've been doing during COVID. Our field's been drastically impacted by the pandemic as yours has been as well. And what we've been able to do as a result of our advocacy and then talk a little bit about mechanisms for elevating early care and educator voice uh, to different levels of policymakers, and then conclude with a little bit about parent voice, uh, which Tanisha was talking about. And it's so important, it's been really effective in California. So next slide, please. Uh, so if we look at just the numbers in Alameda County, we have about 117,000 young children in California, we have about 2.8 million. Uh, nationally, it's 23 million. And then kind of old numbers from the United Kingdom, but what we could find easily were that there are about 3.5 million zero to four-year-olds in the UK. So that might be more comparable to our California when we're thinking about what we could do at different levels. Um, I think the poverty figure is all relative. I'm sure our kids are more poor <laughs> than yours. You just have higher standards. Uh, but also when you look at race ethnicity, we're pretty diverse in California um, and in our county uh, with a lot of Asian American young children, um, Hispanic Latino young children and black young children. And in my county in particular, we just found, uh, we had a family childcare grant. We have home-based childcare that is licensed and uh, providers who receive the grant work with families speaking over 48 different languages. So that's just some background. Next slide, please. Uh, so let's talk about what happened during COVID. And this is a cutie who lives in our county, a teacher and a little one. Next slide, please. Uh, so when the pandemic started in mid-March, uh, at the county level, we formed a coalition of basically organizations that work with our child care field. And we have things called resource and referral agencies that help uh, parents find child care and help support child care programs. Those are funded by our state. Uh, my program, we have a small uh, foundation in every California county uh, called the First Five Commission that has some tobacco tax dollars to give out our social services agency in our county office of ed. And we had a point person for COVID at our public health department. Um, next slide, please. So we came together and we wanted to assess the impact on our childcare field of COVID. And I had just by luck, a young woman um, who's a statistician. And so she was able to start surveying programs with our, uh, our partners. And we saw that pre-COVID here, we had in family childcare homes, like over a thousand spaces and uh, many spaces in our licensed childcare centers. And you could see how drastically the availability of those spaces dropped um, following the pandemic and they are still severely down. Next slide, please. So uh, currently I just got the numbers from November today, but still we only have about 66% of our family-based programs open and 56% of our centers. And that's because the ratios, uh, the group sizes were limited for COVID. And so programs can't make it financially if they even are willing to take the health, health risks to stay open. 
Um, so we use this data to advocate with state policymakers. And um, next slide, please. Um, as a result of that advocacy, our, our California, uh, nationally money was made available, which I'll talk about in a minute, but our California uh, policymakers provided $3 million for family child, uh, no, the, I'm sorry, this is our county provided 3 million for family child care grants and 1 million for supplies for families and providers. And then um, the next slide, please. This was not my county, but in terms of communicating with policymakers, uh, this organization in San Francisco called the Children's Council, I think came up with a really, really powerful um, public information campaign um, pegged to the economy and uh, said, you know, you get medical care because she has child care. And then the next slide, please. Here's another example. You get groceries because she has child care. So focusing on the economic supports child care uh, provides to the economy is really important. Um, and we have a long way to go and we're still struggling. I'm just showing you some of our rays of hope. Um, also, I just wanted to mention quickly, um, Aaron was talking about workforce and it sounds like pay issues. That's absolutely similar in the United States. And we have an am amazing um, research group called the Center for the Study of the Child Care Workforce that has quantified for years and years how underpaid our workforce is. And our workforce is, you know, probably 87, 90% women of color. So it's really a social justice issue as well. And despite all the research, we've been unable to obtain better pay uh, for child care educators or the early care and education workforce. We're still working on it. Um, hopefully poised to do that in California with a supportive governor and um, the economy is that is not completely tanked, although it may be in the long run because of COVID. Uh, but if you look in um, the United States, one region known for getting better pay for the child care workforce is uh, the state of New Jersey which actually required bachelor's level um, degrees for all childcare staff. However, in California or elsewhere, that's really problematic uh, unless you support the current workforce, you know, you grandfather them in because uh, so many of our um, childcare educators are um, dual language learners or just aren't gonna go back and get formal education. So I wanted to mention that. Anyway, so with the combination of data and communications, um, next slide, please. Um, uh, we and the state level advocacy in California, we were able to obtain some state resources for childcare. And in the United States and in California, labor unions have been really influential. Our home based providers recently unionized and they really advocated at the state for um, PPE, which is the protective equipment uh, like masks and sanitizer for working with children. There are associations of subsidized providers who advocated successfully for them to be paid, um, even though they weren't um, serving children in person during the pandemic. Uh, they were providing distance learning and then private providers really um, spearheaded a lot of advocacy themselves around uh, obtaining a priority for vaccines along with K-12 school teachers and they were successful and they still haven't had access to them because we're still just, um, you know, working down from vaccines for healthcare workers. But really the majority of our public K-12 schools have been closed this entire time and our childcare uh, workforce has been supporting parents who need to work and children who need childcare. Um, next slide, please. So a national coalition elevated childcare needs in the United States, again, taking this um, lens that childcare is necessary to keep America working. And you'll see at the bottom, they had data about the number of providers who um, may disappear due to the pandemic that they obtained through surveys. And then next, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, an example of the coalition members in the United States. So um, next slide, an outcome of that work is that at the national government provided 3.5 billion for childcare in its first round of relief funding. 
Uh, in December, it provided $10 billion for child care programs. Um, California is expected to get a billion of this. And then um, our president-elect Joe Biden, who takes office tomorrow, uh, I won't editorialize, uh, is, has provided 40 billion, a proposal for the child care field. And this is, uh, the field had been advocating for $50 billion. So you can see that he's trying to make up the difference, but that has to be debated with our Congress um, before it's confirmed. So, uh, and I'll just add one more thing um, in terms of effective arguments for childcare. Uh, really, I think our, our most effective argument has been that 90% of a child's brain develops uh, before they're five and that childcare helps build those connections. And that seems to have gotten a lot of attention before the pandemic, although it has not um, given childcare providers the wages they deserve, of course. Um, so then I'll just touch, quickly on different mechanisms we've built uh, to elevate a uh, child care program voice on policy. And the first one I'll just summarize is uh, child care planning councils, which is where I've worked for 20 years. Next slide, please. Uh, child care planning councils are uh, funded by the state of California, although not well. Um, I don't know if you all do the equivalent, but we're um, given the equivalent of like a third of a staff person to convene in our county uh, what is a 25 person child care planning council and it the mandated membership by law is 20% child care providers who represent all types of providers family child care school district providers head start and um, both private and public and subsidized and non subsidized providers and other mandated categories include parents, government agencies, and organizations. Next slide, please. These planning councils have a role in terms of collecting information where the child care gaps are the greatest in our areas. And we focus on um, workforce training as well as access and quality and facilities development. And we have a number of committees and we directly inform policy and program decisions at all levels of government, or we'd like to. Uh, we just wrote on Friday a letter to the governor regarding his uh, new proposed budget. Next slide, please. Uh, at the state level, we do have an ECE coalition with the major child care associations and networks and agreeing on priorities is really hard with a very big field. I think everyone would say a workforce pay is the number one. However, uh, it's the most expensive. So we work on other issues uh, and annually agree on priority budget items. Uh, they had one campaign called a billion for babies a couple years ago and this year their campaign is going to be Babies Matter in California. A key ally of this group is the California Women's Legislative Caucus, and this group pays a lobbyist. Next slide. Um, so another way to engage policymakers in the cause of child care is uh, just taking them out to see you and what you're doing at your sites. Next slide, please. Uh, when I was at the Children's Defense Fund, um, which was a pretty well regarded organization, they knew that if uh, leaders could see exemplary providers and children, they themselves could be a forceful voice for advocacy. And it used site visits uh, to target populations like philanthropists or service organizations to spark their advocacy. Next slide, please. So uh, we take uh, leaders out to see really great programs and couple it with policy information. Uh, we focused on how, uh, how programs like childcare programs are prevention versus later expensive intervention and children themselves are the best ambassadors for the work. Um, next slide, please. Uh, there's a quote uh, by Mark Twain who said, if you're looking for friends when you need them, it's too late. So the idea of Child Watch is you build, you cultivate the relationships. Um, in terms of other noteworthy advocacy in the US, in the late 1980s, there, uh, there was a big childcare, one of the first childcare investments. And the advocacy for it was 
uh, supported by creating, having um, providers all over the United States send in uh, pieces of a paper chain with writing the children's names and ages on it, um, elected officials signed the chain and they created a link from the White House to the Capitol to have an event to advocate for that, which obviously would be harder during the pandemic. And um, the key is just finding a way for providers to be advocates, uh, regardless of whether they are big public speakers, they can just stand in hearings with bright signs. Um, in the old days, there was a big campaign in North Carolina where they faxed in uh, support for a bill and it was starting to annoy the staff of the policymakers. Uh, but that's the point, uh, there's strength in numbers and you have power. Next slide, please. Finally, just parent voice and what they've been able to accomplish in California. Next slide, please. Uh, there's a nonprofit called uh, Parent Voices, which organizes uh, parents to be advocates for affordable, accessible and quality childcare and parent stories have so much influence on elected officials. It's really, you can see it. You can see them paying attention. Uh, there's 16 chapters in our state and our local Parent Voices chapter in Oakland uh, initiated with unions a campaign that was successful to um, get $150 million locally for early care and education. Uh, actually, it's pending in the courts. There are legal lawsuits, but we are optimistic this will happen, and that's one way of um, increasing provider pay. And they also obtained $100,000 in county funding um, from an elected official for a, a program for homeless child care that we are trying to help turn into a statewide program. And next slide. Thank you so much. I know um, there are some parallels and some differences in our work, but hopefully there's something in there you'll find useful in the United Kingdom. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Ellen. That, that was really, really interesting. And um, I, I particularly enjoyed the, the North Carolina story. Um, but it, yeah, it might have annoyed the policies, but there's something about that, that, that cohesion, that working together to, to get the sector noticed that is, yeah, that's, that, that's something very much worth thinking about. Thank you so much. Um, Mona, I'm, I'm going to hand over to you now yeah, because perfect. you're organizing the next bit. Thanks, Maddie. Um, so in Maddie's background, you could hear Peppa Pig and her toddler with Peppa Pig. In my background, you will hear screaming. At the moment, it's happy screaming, but I don't know how long that will last for, but they are cared for, so just ignore it if you can. Um, so amazing thoughts there and things that we need to get our head around and so much to kind of think about. Um, Aaron, you know, key words, confidence, recognition, and those being at the, the center of voice. Tanisha, the importance of empowering parents, which really connects with what Ellen was talking about at the end, and just generally changing the discourse, that how can we build our voice if we don't change the discourse and make it known that we are important and we are here. Um, and Ellen, so much that you said, which was really important around data communications, around advocacy, um, but also something that really caught, caught my attention that I think I hope will come up in the breakout room discussions and in the general discussion is around priorities. That if you're going to speak out, you better know what you're going to speak out for and what are you going to say? We all want this. And is there something that we can all agree on in the context of quite a, you know, a fragmented sector in England in particular, what can we agree on that really we can then put to the policymakers and we can really make our voices heard on? So lots to think about. What's going to happen now? Because this event is 100% about dialogue. It's about people feeling that they have a chance to reflect and connect so we're going to put you into breakout rooms for 10 minutes. So just 10 minutes uh, with five or six other people. Connect with them, uh, chat to them. And if you can, as a group, come up with kind of one uh, theme, comment or question that you really want to throw back to the speakers that we can use to get a dialogue and a discussion going so that we move this on to the next level and it becomes really something a bit more collective and a bit more collaborative um and it's always a good sign 
when you have to wait for the countdown to go all the way to the bottom before everybody rejoins, that's a sign that people are actually using the breakout room and getting into the discussion. So that's good. So we're going to have a go now at kind of bringing together thoughts, bringing out thoughts and reflections and what you connected over in the breakout rooms. And you have different ways of doing that. So um, you can put your comments and your questions into the chat. Um, and I and, and, and Maddie will do our best to kind of field those and put those to the speakers as well as the speakers, of course, can, can identify for themselves things that they want to talk about. Um, you can also unmute and just ask your question as a, as a real human being and not through text. So it really is up to you how you want to kind of engage in the discussion and the dialogue. And the questions are really for everybody. So it is as much as a discussion and people joining in and, and thinking together as we can possibly manage in this kind of forum. Uh, so don't be shy, make yourself heard, make yourself known and, and get into the discussion and the dialogue. So please do be typing away into the chat now with your, with your thoughts and your comments and your questions. If it's okay, one of the benefits of being in this position is maybe I can get to start <laughs> because one of the things I was thinking about in the last 10 minutes a lot is, is there something that we can all agree on? Is there something that we can all agitate for change on? This is it. And is there something small that we can all agree on? Because, you know, I've got this friend who's a community organizer and she told me the trick of community organizing is that you start with something small. You start with something you can actually win. So you don't go, here is this massive, we need to change the identity of the sector. We need to do this. We need to do this. You go, here is one thing that we know that we all need. You know, I don't know whether it's testing at the moment in early year settings, for example. Could we all go, yes, this is something that we need. And then make it happen and in doing that actually start to find what this voice might look like and how it might feel to all come together in that kind of way so i'm just going to throw that out and see whether speakers but also participants just want to come in on that and and kind of get the discussion going from there i think that was actually what we were saying as well what is the one thing that we can agree on because there's not a lot that we all agree on. So, yeah. And how far did you get, Leila, in terms no, we, of... We got to the uniting factor being what is what we do we agree <laughs> on. That's the question that we have to start from. Um, yeah. No. Uh, I don't know. I had a thought, though, at the end, just as it was going out to break out. Do we have, besides, is it called Parent Unite? They were on... They were on Ruth's Zoom thing last week, the week before. Aaron, do you know who I mean? Well, are they called? Are they like a lobbying group then? Yeah. Do we have anybody yeah. else in the UK that's like that? We have Tactic, who are a um, who advocate and lobby for the sector. I think part of the problem we have is that there are so many different groups and it's hard to get everybody to work together there are there are obviously attempts to do that but that that possibly is something that also needs to be addressed i mean that's that, that's kind of what we were discussing in our group i think the the main thing is for me, in, if we want to change or influence policies for the whole sector to come together as one and to have one voice. Um, and we were discussing how can we raise awareness? What, what, what can we do to raise awareness? Um, and that was our question to bring back for a discussion. And what was it awareness of, Tanisha? Awareness of the importance of early years? The importance of early years. Yeah, the importance of early years. That's what we really wanted to... I mean, that was our question. Um, and I think I think with the, with the COVID-19 at the moment is a real example of um, how effective it can be and how it can bring positive change if we all work together as one sector. 
and 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 um, with the same message, I think, um, yeah, that's a thought that I would like to dis, you know. And so we're all talking very much about this one sector, but what's really, really important is I, I noticed in the chat earlier around maintain nursery schools and early years prov providers. And it's those small kind of understanding of actually what are they? What, why are they different? Why are they perceived to be different? So you talked very much about those small small steps which can really make a big change and I'm continually having to kind of even just have you know Layla will be one of them we've had these conversations in the past why is the maintained nursery school treated differently to you know the the, 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 the nursery down the road and the, the the defining difference is is that one of them is under you know under under the regulatory body is the school um, so actually it, it is treated differently because the outcomes are different. It's offsteaded under the school inspection framework. It has um, a, a governing body. So, and the only reason why I know that is because I'm a chair of governors of a maintained nursery school. So I think things like that, that we don't necessarily always know about the complexities that actually even sit within our earlier sector. We need to understand those complexities before we can even try and understand what does one sector really mean um and I, and I think those little small steps those small changes can really make a difference could i say something there um as well we talked about this a little bit in our group group two that government is critically aware of the difference between the pvi sector funding which is low and the maintain nursery school funding, which they deem as expensive. And they do want parity, but they want parity by reducing the funding to maintain nursery sector to bring it down. They're not looking to raise funding to have us all on an unequal playing field and properly funded. So I think the real issues there and sometimes um, we can get involved in looking at what each other are doing instead of looking up to government and saying, you know, what are you doing for us? How can you raise standards and salaries and across the board, you know, funding across the board for the sector? Because with the exception of maintained nursery schools, there are real issues um, throughout relating to um, salaries, aren't there? And, and equal pay for um, the job that people are doing. I think that's a key point and it makes me think as well and there's a bit of talk about this in in the chat around language as well because yes it's it's understanding the different types of provider and so on but there's also so much difference in in the language that we use in early years whether we talk about early years whether we talk about child care whether we mix it up and talk about early childhood education and care there's kind of so many labels and Ellen, I, I was wondering, you know, in, in the context where you are, is that a conversation that you're having? Does language matter or should we just be kind of cracking on with action? Yeah, it's our system is super complicated and it's similar to yours. Like, I think our PVIs, we call Title 22 programs, and then we have um better funded programs through our education system. And there's always discussion about better standards in the education system, higher standards and better salaries and trying to equalize. Um, so really that's where we're just leaving that aside and focusing on increased investments um, and then figuring out where those are, but um, the other distinction is we have vouchers, like subsidies that come with a kid versus independently subsidized programs that are education programs for the most part. And what we're saying in California, like all this early, uh, billion for babies, people are trying to get more money to the voucher system, frankly. Um, 
But everyone, want, I don't know, there seems to be a common um, support for that right now because the education system is better funded and older kids. And those aren't the one, you know, those are um, better. There's not as much demand. The, the demand is scarcer or is higher for the young children right now. That's all I can tell you. But focusing on increased investments and working, frankly, with the women elected officials seem to be two strategies. Although Governor Newsom is very supportive and some men are as well, but generally speaking, looking for allies with women. Yeah, I'm interested in how people responded to the um, the, the campaign that you showed us, Ellen, around the you know, you get groceries because she gets childcare, you get medical support because she gets childcare, because that it's, it's really interesting and it's really powerful. But at the same time, there's also a tension because we're, we're trying to say, no, but it's not just childcare. <laughs> it's not just, it, you know, we're trying to get away from the kind of yeah. babysitting here. Right. More it's not custodial. Yeah, absolutely. Same thing. And that's where the brain development argument, I think, um, is building some bridges that the educators, early educators are changing the architecture of children's brains that'll have lasting impacts. Um, it, it's not just babysitting. They need, and they need to be playing, right? It needs to be developmentally appropriate. Um, and that's where you might have more, um, a variety of points of view around what philosophy the program employs. And that's, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, whether it's Montessori or Reggio, we're not trying to control that. We're just trying to get more money into the system. But also starting small, because we're still, you know, the workforce is still poorly paid. We need to change that maybe through rates, programs are paid, but that's not gonna, if it hasn't happened in 30 years, we're not gonna get that in the next 12 months probably, right? So what little steps can be taken? Can I ask Ellen, um, I, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this or not, but so you have, there were beautiful examples of communication campaigns. How much do these things cost? Yeah, you know, San Francisco is an anomaly or an outlier because uh, it's a relatively wealthy city with um, a, a very small number of children. So they just put in 25 million like last week to support even more. And they have lots of special taxes for kids. I don't think that campaign was very expensive. Um, I also don't think, um, you know, in, in San Francisco, they were already kind of bought in. So I, it's in another area, I don't know. I don't know what the cost would be. And we, we want to adapt, we want to use that. Um, their graphics as well. And I think they'd be, you know, we've reached out to them because they can be adapted. Yeah. You see, I mean, it's easy for us to be able to put things out via social media, but the problem with social media is that you're generally preaching to the converted. The ideal scenario would be to see those wonderful things um, all over every bus shelter, for example. But this is a notoriously underfunded sector. So, so where do we find the, the wherewithal to do that? So um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I had to ask the, the economics question there. Thank you. Yeah, you know, enough to pay an ad firm, but then to get it on the buses, you need, you need partnerships and things like that. I would say another um, a campaign that's related that was super um, successful or effective in the US uh, was called Talk, Read, Sing about talking to your baby you know, and singing with them as soon as they're born. But that wasn't to invest in childcare. That was more trying to equip parents with the tools. And, um, you know, Hillary Clinton was a champion of that and did a lot of fundraising nationally to do that. But UK is smaller, so you can do it. <laughs> yeah, it kind of, it's reminding me of... Um, a conference I went to around like men in childcare 
and the the discussion was around okay let's have a campaign to get more men into childcare but then so much disagreement over what that campaign would look like do you show a man doing a typically manly thing with the children <laughs> or do you show that actually do you kind of counter those gender stereotypes do you work with the gender stereotypes do you counter them and so similarly here that the issue is okay so we want to get the message out there let's say we could get the the money to get the message out there but what's the message is the message hey you need to look after this sector because you can't do anything without childcare or is the message you need to look after this sector because the future of 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 the population is in the hands of this sector I, I think certainly in in the uh, group that I was in, the the discussion was around the fact that it, it it is those two points that need to be raised. On the one hand, you can't go to work unless you have the childcare. On the other hand, this is the, the the future of our children that we're talking about, and to ensure that they have the best possible future, you need quality early years education and care. I agree with, with that statement that both are significant, but there's a little bit of me that feels that just saying that we're only here so that everybody else can go out to work demeans what we do. And I know that's not what we're saying, but I think if there's too much emphasis on that part of the campaign, there is a sense that it will demean the fact that we are building children's brains, you know, in the first five years of their lives, which is so important. Um, and I also think, is there's something around that investment in the early years, that social investment, you know, even the Duchess of Cambridge's campaign made reference to the fact that it'll save billions, every pound invested in the early years will potentially save um, expenditure in the social, injust social justice system and things like that going, going forward. So that's almost a third strand to it as well, but I suppose there's a bit of me that, although I see that without childcare, the rest of society can't exist, I wouldn't want that to be outweighing the, the value of early childhood education and care in, it, of it, in and of itself. I completely agree, Sarah. I think the, 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 you will never raise the status of the sector if you focus too much on care because care is perceived to be something that you can, people can instinctively do. Mothers care. I mean, if you think about where childcare came from in, in you know, and early years came from, it came from preschool learning alliance in the early days where the mums got together, pre, you know, to build something so their children could have access to, to play opportunities. It's still perceived as something mums can do and women can do. And therefore no one is going to pay the, the salary that, that real childhood educators deserve if we go down that route. Marilyn? That's a great point. Hello. What, what, what I, I mean, I think we're just talking about different things. And I think we have to put them into the different things that they are. We do need something to raise the public awareness about if they didn't have someone to look after their children, whether it was in school, whether it's they wouldn't be able to function in life. They wouldn't be able to do their shopping. So I think that's one issue. The other issue is it's got to be something that people can engage with. If you're going to um, put forward about the importance of good quality care, education, whatever you want to call it, then it's got to be something that parents and society can engage with. Because our biggest problem is not so much as somebody said, we're all talking the same thing. It's the general perception within society. And I think, I, I, I know what you mean, Maureen, but I think we've moved on from that. I think we have to be thinking about, people now know that early childhood is important because certain famous people have said it is, but we're not getting across about the issues within um, early childhood that we're all talking about. But first of all, I think we have to get the public awareness um, to the importance of good, of childcare and education, but then once they've engaged with that, engage with why it's so important for young children, 
to have a quality have quality experiences and i don't think any parent would disagree with you from my perspective the reason that parents don't necessarily have the best quality care and education for their children is because they can't afford it thank you james i think you were going to come in earlier Oh, sorry, I'm running around the house. Um, <laughs> I think that that's the exciting point, I think, is that is that question about whether society is as aware as we think it is. Certainly the discourse we've had over COVID has been on school readiness, children being behind when they're coming out of the early years sector, whether you want to call it childcare, whether you want to call it education, etc. So the wider opinion, which I think there's, I think the wider society is getting through the media, is that in some way children are being disadvantaged by what we do um, so we need to seize that narrative and really push on the fact that yes we are essential we do need funding we do need you to understand what we do and one of the greatest mistakes we ever made was getting rid of you know that level of uh, training of people within secondary education on early childhood and having you know teaching teenagers the importance of uh, child development because there's lots of people that, who come into our settings now and you know at the trainee level who've not had that experience um, so that's one area we can perhaps look at as well as making sure that wider society do have an understanding of child development because that isn't there yet so is princess kate just going to save us because i mean i quite like the idea of being saved by a princess a princess charming it would be quite a nice, I don't mind, I mean, yeah, I don't know, I'm sure people feel very, very differently about it. And, and, and obviously, with the, with all of this research that was done, you know, it's kind of highlighting things that people within the sector are like, uh-huh, yeah, that, yeah, we know, we know it's important, we know it's important for families, we know it's important for children, we know it helps with, uh, against loneliness and, and judge and feeling judged and blah, 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 blah. But, but perhaps perhaps there is real value in 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 a princess coming on board. Um, Jackie, you've got your hand. I was just going to agree really with a couple of the the other the guys that spoke. I think it is really important that the importance the, the research evidence is there. We all know that, and I think the difficulty is working at how to communicate that to the broader population. Um, and I think yeah, a big ad campaign might do that, but as we've mentioned, that's a lot of money. Um, Maybe maybe a princess is a way to get a lot of attention to, to something that doesn't otherwise get attention, apart from for very pragmatic reasons. You know, I, I'm a parent myself that has two children in childcare. I should say, care, early years at care, care and education. Because I, I personally, I think that's what we should be referring to as. It is. So it's just something. Um, sorry, <laughs> breastfeeding at the same time. Um, so I think these are really important issues. And I think the difficulty is working out how we communicate them. Um, I think social media can do its bit, but as people have said, that's very, I think policy can do its bit and advocacy can do its bit. And I think getting that all um, joined up is really important. And I think the issue about having an overarching governance or uh, uh, um, association is really key. And I, and I think that's something that's probably worth um, more work being done on. Thank you so much. As, as we're kind of coming towards the end, I think, what's the steer here? Where do we need to go next? What is the next discussion? What is the next bit of dialogue that we need to be putting in place in order to move things forward in terms of early years voice? Uh, I don't know your name, I'm afraid, because the, the, it just says iPad, but you have your hand raised, so please, please just speak. Sorry, that's me. Um, I was just going to say, I think the problem with, with saying that, you know, early years is all about helping other people get to their work and, and the value to them is that it diminishes our value and that will become a commodity. You know, there's those studies where you said, if, if you're late, we're going to fine you. And then actually parents going, oh, OK, that's fine. I can be late because I'll just pay a little bit of money. You know, we become not as valued. And I think if we want to, to be more um, valued in education, then really there needs to be a lot more awareness of what 
early education is and what it involves and the value of it. And actually, if we're not promoting that, then we're really doing ourselves a disservice and no one's going to take it seriously. Which links, I think, really well to Tanisha, what you were talking about in your presentation. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I just I feel um, that we need to tell our stories of what we do and how important it is. Um, I mean, for example, I've, I've got friends who are teachers and so on. And I was having a conversation just today with somebody who was saying... Um, he was speaking to one of her um, colleagues who were talking about the planning and so on and they use spreadsheets but when you compare it to the in-depth of how we plan um, for the individual child their interest there's so much work that goes into it to make what we do so ambitious linking it to the community and everything and I think it's about us finding a way to tell our story and to really inform the community and the parents and people who we work with of exactly what we do because I don't think they realize how much we do and that's why I value all the parent events that I do because it just has such a positive impact all around um, socially um, educating the parents to, to, to understand how important it is to to support their children and and so on so yeah I totally agree about we need to raise the awareness of how hard we work and um, I was, I, we was also saying in our in our room um, that there's a lot of um, courses or workshops like these that are advertised, and majority of them, um, you've got to pay fifty pounds, ninety pounds. And I mean, if we're going to come together and 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 to have a voice, I just feel like that's one of the the issues um, why why it's not why there's not much awareness because. We're so underpaid in this sector. Um, we hardly have any money to like take care of ourselves and then having to pay to, to listen and to gain more knowledge that is so important um, about the sector and that would you know empower us to raise more awareness and so on. So, yeah. Thank you so much. So maybe maybe it's storytelling and we've got yeah. in the comments, James Butler saying, tell yeah. us, yes, yes, yes. So yeah. I there is yeah, I think it's about telling our story, finding a way to do that, because it's, it's just it's so important. And um, um, I think Ellen, she talks a lot about the brain development, which I that's really close to my heart. And I think it's so important um, for for as many people to understand the importance of the, the early brain development um, and just how important it is just to talk to your child, talk to your baby, just to be a commentator. And, and so on a lot of parents do it and don't realize what the benefits that they're doing and the impact is having on their child they just think they're talking but we really need, we need to um yeah let them understand even I mean I've got one of my staff members she's from um Africa and um she was saying how much she's learned about um nurturing and interacting with your pet with your children and and how that impacts and she can see the difference in her older child and her younger one now and when she goes back home she feels that there are some changes that are made from um her sharing the knowledge and so on so i think we underestimate how much we really do and we really need to tell our stories i think that's, a, that's an amazing place to to maybe move Maddie, do you want to attempt to close the event? <laughs> um, well, I, I'm sure you all, all join me in uh, saying a, a very big thank you um, to our three wonderful uh, guest speakers this evening. You've been fabulous and you've given us um, an awful lot to think about. Um, so as always, you, you, you can find us on Twitter and um, we have, as you are aware, recorded this event and we will be uploading the videos of the event uh, to a few different sites. So they'll be easy for you to access. They'll be on the Belmas pages. But for those of you who aren't uh, Belmas members, Mona and I will put them on our, our Open Access University pages as well. We will put the link out um, via Twitter. If you've got any questions um, about this event or future events, please do contact us uh, via Twitter. Um, Mona, can you stick the, the, the handle in the, in the chat, please? Because uh, I've temporarily forgotten it. 
And uh, yes, we'll, we'll get back to you as soon as we possibly can. So yeah, it just remains for me to say to all of you, thank you ever so much um, for contributing to the discussion this evening. Um, David writes, yes, I, two year olds, always tricky. Uh, fortunately, mine's been behaving herself this evening, but uh, wonderful to have you and a two year old as well. And I saw a dog earlier, so fantastic. Everyone is welcome. <laughs> Okay, thank you all and have a lovely evening. Uh, enjoy you your meals much. and we'll see you soon. And Zoe, yes, thank you, thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>